Historians believe that the Mizos are a migratory tribe who have come to their present settlement around the 1600 and 1700 AD from China through Myanmar. Of the Mongoloid race, they speak a language that is said to belong to the Tibeto-Burman family of languages. The people are yellow-skinned, with small slit eyes, and the sub-tribes and clans among the Mizos are able to speak and understand the most common tongue called Lusei or Dulian dialect. Among the many sub-tribes and clans in the Mizo society, Lusei, Mar, Poi, Paite and Mara are the major sub-tribes. The typical Mizo village was built upon certain norms and had a meaningful structure. The village site was carefully decided upon by the chief in consultation with his elders, taking into account its location, its safety from enemy forces, availability of water and fertility of the land. The most important locality in every village was the Mualveng or Tlangveng, which housed the chief's mansion. Around the chief's house, were houses of his close relatives and elders, after which came the houses of the common people called Zalien. Each locality was thus divided for housing people of different stature. The bachelor's dormitory, Zolbuk, was placed in the heart of the village, where it could serve as a watchhouse for advancing enemies. A typical Mizo house was built at an elevation from the ground and was made of thatch and bamboo. It usually had a single room and opened to the veranda-like structure called Lake Apui. It also had a sumhun, where the women folk would pound rice. Inside the house was a tapsak, a fireplace also used for cooking, above which was the raptsung, where they kept locks for the hearth and other things of import. The floor as well as beds were all made of bamboo. Every Mizo village had a chief who was the supreme authority in the administrative setup. Theoretically, all that was in the village belonged to him and he was greatly loved and respected by the people. He could and did call upon the people to furnish him with all he needed in the form of food crops and hunted animals. The chieftainship was hereditary and different villagers had different clans as their chiefs. A council of elders aided the chief in his administration. Under them were another set of people with specific functions, including the Kotsiar, Thirdeng, Sadot, Bolpu and the Tlangau, the public crier, who announced all the important information which the chief wanted to disseminate to the public. A visitor to Mizoram is treated to a vision of a typical Mizo village in the models that have been specially built for this purpose at the outskirts of Aizol, at Falcon and Ray Egg villages. The rest of the village comprised of the common people called Zalien. The traditional Mizo society was patriarchal, where women and children did not usually partake in the administration. The Mizos are a sociable people who lived together in villages like a large family showing due respect to elders and giving special care to the aged and the underprivileged were the norms that guided the society. Such a life did not allow for the existence of great disparity between villagers and the Mizos never knew beggars. Rice beer called Zhu was of great significance in their social life. Every household brewed their own rice beer and it was freely consumed both in the house and on festive occasions. Rice beer was also an integral part of the chief's meetings with his council of elders. Such meetings would often be followed by what is called Tseilam or Tseizai, where the better dancers are invited over to entertain the villagers' nobles.
Since the drinking was controlled by societal norms, excessive drinking and drunkards in the society were almost unknown. The first step in any Mizo marriage is courtship by men. The young men were free to court any young lady in the village by visiting her at home, sometimes till the wee hours of the night. It was considered impolite for women to show their disregard to any man, even if she was not inclined towards her suitor. This was the norm in the marriage of commoners, but for sons in the chief's family, arranged marriages between ruling families was a common practice. On the consent of the two young people, the young man's family would send an emissary called Palai to the girl's side. This Palai was very important because on him rested the responsibility of seeing the proposal to its fruition. The actual marriage ceremony was a simple affair, though certain ground laws governed it. The most significant marriage law was the bride price, for which family heirlooms like maithans, guns and darbu would be given, a payment in kind, now substituted by a cash payment of 420 rupees for most marriages. The women's position in society was rather pathetic. This did not improve with marriage because husbands were free to evict them from the household on any whim and in such cases, no security was due to them in the form either of property or possessions. The major occupations and means of livelihood were cultivation, fishing and hunting. It is safe to say that like most agrarian communities, the lives of the Mizo people were solely dependent on what nature had to offer. With the exception of children and the aged, the entire community set out to work on their farmlands and this sometimes even required staying at their fields for an extended period. The young men and women would partake in what they called in lom when they took turns working in each other's lands. Since they practiced jhum cultivation, they shifted and moved to new lands every year and that entailed a lot of hard work. Each family worked laboriously to meet their needs. Hunting was another occupation indulged in by the menfolk and those who distinguished themselves in hunting were held in high regard. A pasaltra, as such men were called, were the backbone of the society that depended largely on the spoils of hunting expeditions. Laying traps was a common form of providing for their families as well. The various types of traps that were commonly laid were tangkleng, saadal, Tang Zep, Mang Kong, Bai, Butzuk, Gilen, Zip Tang, Bil, Not Dot, Fall, and other traps for various other animals. Sangavuak, a form of fishing, was another means of sustenance. The use of fishing nets was known, and they also used other means like Ngaotzia and Ruavuak, where wood and bamboo slates were often used to drug the fish into submission. Such tasks were commonly undertaken as a community where the entire catch would be equally distributed among the families of the village. This was a wonderful means of entertainment for the villagers as well. On the occurrence of death in the locality, all the young people, both male and female, gathered to sing throughout the night in condolence of the bereaved family. The following day, male members would get together to dig graves and see the funeral right through up to the filling up of the graves. Every family makes monetary and material contribution for the benefit of the bereaved family. Some young men, as much as 20 members, would sleep with the bereaved family for three nights to comfort and secure them. Kwanu was the name given by the primitive Mizos to an all-powerful being who could not be seen but whom they believed was the creator and supreme authority over all his creations. Worship of Kwanu was not the general practice. 
Instead, religious consciousness arose primarily out of a fear of spirits whom they believed could do them harm. Such spirits like Klashang, Koshing, Tual Sum Su, Gui, Zun Hin Dot and Choi Fa were propitiated by the performance of some religious rites and sacrifices. Any illness befalling a person was also considered a curse for which sacrifices would be performed immediately. They also believed in the Lassi, the fairy goddess Tong Tin Leri, whom they believed governed all wild animals and determined success in hunting. Sacrifices were performed under the supervision of the Sadot and the Puithyam, or the priests. They believed that the evil spirits they were trying to appease lived in the large hills dotting the land. As such, they often offered worship to large hills like Rei Ek, Mumrang and Lur. The people of the village would come together to perform Kung Pui Sial, a sacrifice at the beginning of the year for a good harvest for which they killed pigs and chicken. Laulama in Toy is another rite they performed for the protection of their lands from harmful animals and birds. Sacrificial rites performed to cure afflicted persons were called Daibol in Toy, and this rite could only be performed at the village outskirts. Depending on the nature of the ailment, pigs and chicken could be used in such rites. Every Mizo had a Zolbuk, the bachelor's dormitory. It was an important institution which also served as the only organized platform for an education of sorts. It was a large, single-roomed house made of thatch and bamboo with no separate door. At the entrance was a large tree trunk they called Bobel, sliding over which the men would enter the Zolbog. In the middle was a large fireplace where they would all sit together at nights listening to their elders. Young men were taught basic manners, courtesy and tlomgaitna, the spirit of selflessness. A very interesting activity was the prevalence of wrestling, in which the young men in the Zolbog indulged, especially with any guests or strangers. The most significant purpose of the Zolbog, though, was the protection of the village. It was a kind of barrack from where the men could arm themselves and move quickly should there be any danger threatening the village. Occasions when the entire community came together to celebrate their year's hard work was called Gut. They came together for such celebrations during the harvest season when they could spare time to enjoy the fruits of their harvest. Since those were the only times the entire community could come together in a relaxed atmosphere, they looked forward to the different Gut and they were the highlights of the Mizou community life. There are three major festivals with each having a significance of its own in the social and religious life of the Mizos. Polkut and Mimkut were the two important festivals which have not been celebrated for several generations. Tsapsarkut, the greatest and biggest of the Mizokuts, continues to be celebrated with much pomp. It is not possible to determine the exact date of its origins, However, it is believed that the Kut was celebrated at the time our ancestors were settled around the Run and Triao rivers near the Myanmar border. It is celebrated around the end of March at a time when they could find respite after clearing forests for their Jum. Every family buys beer and laid animal traps in anticipation of the coming Kut. The actual celebration can last anywhere between two to seven days. On the first day, everyone would come out with their fares and they had a feast of potluck, feeding each other with their food. This is called Tsong Not. 
In the evenings, they came out with their best clothes and ornaments and danced the Tsai throughout the night. The celebration of Tzapzarkut does not allow for domestic problems of any sort and all villagers are expected to partake of the good celebrations in complete harmony. Thank <laughs> you.